All right, so, so welcome back from, from lunch. Um, we're going to have uh, one more lecture uh, before uh, we are set out for the, for the tours. Um, so um, our lecturer now is uh, Phil Buxbaum, and he's going, uh, he promised to, to give us an introduction uh, for those of us who are not uh, AMO experts. Uh, remind us of the structure of the micro uh, of the hydrogen molecule that we all learned and forgot, and uh, uh, sorry, hydrogen hydro hydrogen atom, not not molecules. <laughs> uh, yes, um, yes. So um, please, uh, Phil, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. I, also, let, let me, even though it's the second day here, let, let me welcome you again to come participate in the school. This is really wonderful. Um, I've been at most of the twelve schools, not all of them. But this is only the, the third time that I'm a lecturer. And it's the second time only that I'm lecturing on what's supposed to be my specialty, which is atomic physics. So it says atomic molecular, you'll see, you'll, you'll see what we're really doing. So the first thing I would like to do is ask everyone, I'll, I'll ask you to use your cards later. But for right now, just a show of hands, who here is an atomic physicist? OK. Yeah, the two that I know are raise their hands. OK, that's what I thought. All right, well, in that case, now get your cards ready, because we'll start with, a, with an entry quiz. What's your initial image of an atom? So there's three, four images of atoms up there. And this will just give me a sense of what you think of. Don't work on it too hard. Come on, they're all atoms, so there's no wrong answer. But you know. Okay, high, raise them high. See, uh, see a few greens there. Yeah, okay. Those are the theorists, probably. Um, yeah, oh, we've got one, one red star, like that one. Um, and uh, absolutely no blue squares. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, I'll take that as uh, a good sign. Uh, there's a, a quite a few. Um, well, not really quite a few. There's a lot of references on this subject of x-rays interacting with atoms. There's a good reason for that. But I want to concentrate on pointing you in a particular direction, which is Robin Santra. He's a, uh, actually, he's the person who's mostly in charge of running these summer schools when they're in Hamburg. Uh, he usually selects the chair because he's, I don't know, that's because he's a good member of our community, and that's what he does. But, but. He has uh, a, a paper which uh, I used a lot because it was called a PhD tutorial. So it was the right, at the right level. So you can start there. Uh, there's also some uh, web page, pages that you can point to for data and so forth. Come to those. So, so advertisement was hydrogen molecule, but that's wrong. So here it is, Schrodinger's equation for hydrogen. So. I want to point out a few things. First, it actually describes the dynamics of the electron in hydrogen. So we're really talking about electron motion here. Also, it has some constants in it. In addition to Z, which is the charge of the nucleus, it also has the uh, electric charge, the mass of the electron, and Planck's constant. Here's the ground state solution. Uh, to uh, the second order differential equation for the uh, lowest energy uh, eigen solution. And it also has those constants. This A naught is something that has the dimensions of length, and so it's the size of the atom. And again, I want to point out that atoms are small. Now, you probably already knew that because you can't see them even though you're made up of them. But they're, they're, they're about on the order of an angstrom. Here are the binding energies. Now, the, there are lots of states in hydrogen, as I'm sure you know. The ground state is n equals 1, but if you add n's, you'll get less deeply bound states. And the, the characteristic energy scale for all of that is on the order of tens of electron volts. So we here in atomic physics, which you are now part of for the next 90 minutes or 85 minutes, uh, you will become atomic physicists too. So we will adopt what atomic physicists arrogantly call natural units for this problem. Those are the units where we get rid of as many constants in this equation as possible. It's the obvious thing to do, right? So set h bar equal to 1, mass of the electron, that should be 1, and the electric charge should be 1. 
That's it. That's it. If you do that, the speed of light is fast, but it's not terribly fast. It's 137 uh, atomic units of speed. And uh, the Schrodinger's equation gets to look a lot simpler because we got rid of those, those, sign, those, those, uh, those symbols. Uh, the atomic unit of time is interesting for me because that's my particular take on atomic physics. It's 24 attoseconds, and attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And the atomic unit of cross-section will be important uh, for, for this tutorial lecture because it's, it's on the order of a few tens of megabarns, megabarns being an important, you know, it's basically, it's a quarter of a square angstrom, so that turns out to be megabarns. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a, a big Wikipedia thing on what, on what a, why it's called a barn. 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters is called a barn. It, and believe me, it has nothing to do with atomic physics. It has to do with uh, nuclear physics, in particular neutron scattering. When I was a kid, about your age, I uh, worked in a group that had a book gathering dust on the shelf called the Barn Book, which was all the neutron scattering cross sections. And we still, slaves to history, and I'll bring up that subject again during the lecture, uh, use, uh, use the barns to describe cross sections. Now, uh, we don't deal with hydrogen mostly, and in fact, for X-ray scattering, we do not deal with hydrogen, period. We deal with other atoms, and so they have multiple electrons in order to neutralize the higher charge on the nucleus, and they need to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And I hope, I hope this is sort of wafting over you and just, yeah, no, yeah, it's okay, because it'll pick up. You'll see. So, how, do you, how does that feeling go? Well, there are two n squared electrons per energy shell. The electrons do not distribute themselves uniformly in energy. They're in shells with big gaps between the shells, gaps in energy. And each shell has two n squared electrons where n is any integer starting with one. And because we are slaves to history, we call these shells, instead of one, two, and three, we call them k, l, m, and so forth. It's just what we do. And uh, inside each shell, there are electrons that have different angular momenta. Uh, there, there are, in fact, um, angular momenta ranging from none, and this isn't counting spin, by the way, I'll get to that in a minute, but angular momenta er, 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 from none to n minus one units of h bar of angular momenta. And because we are also slaves to history, this time we're being slaves to 19th century spectroscopy, we call them not 0, 1, and 2, and so forth. We call them S, P, D, and F. It's just what we do. So there are 2 times 2L plus 1 electrons per subshell, where that extra 2 is because each, each one of these definite L, definite N states can have two different spins, two, two different spin directions to accommodate the, the spin of the electron. Okay? Well, here's a little table to add it all up. Uh, the K shell has two electrons, the L shell has eight, and the M shell has 18. And here's what you see in uh, Google images for an atom. And what I like about it is that it's not completely wrong. It's got the shells, right? It's got the shells. So they got that, at least that part right. Okay, now uh, how energetic are these shells? Well, here's a table which, you know, don't stare too, at too hard, but I'll explain some things about it. Uh, the K shell, that's N equals 1, uh, gets to be more and more deeply bound uh, for higher and higher charge on the nucleus. That's called atomic number. The L shell also, but it's lagging behind, the M shell lagging behind. And these splittings are because of electrostatic splittings that occur inside the shells because different electrons in the shell have different angular momenta. They see each other differently, and so there's a little bit of a splitting. So here is where we start to get to the very, very first idea of intuition about atoms. Let's make a crude guess for how deeply bound this inner electron, or the two of them, in the K shell are bound. How deeply are they bound? Well, one idea is to use this, the, the, the Newtonian spherical, you know, approximation is that uh, the only the only force that matters, or the charge that matters, is the charge that's inside a sphere uh, of a spherical distribution. So that's the determines the force. So I have to 
overcome that force. I have to do work against that to pull an electron out. So it's not the whole charge of the nucleus I'm working against because there's some screening from the other electron. But I can, I can go look up how much energy it takes to liberate these electrons and then find out what that screening is. And I see that it's between one and two charges. It's about one and two charges worth of screening, which isn't much for a heavy atom and it's pretty significant for a light atom. Okay. So get ready with your cards. So our initial question about atoms and ultrafast x-rays is which of these two kinds of atoms, carbon with z equals 6 and oxygen with z equals 8, not that different. Don't forget they're, they're the, the, uh, the binding energy of a, of a hydrogenic atom with only one electron is z squared times the Rydberg. Okay, which of these two atoms will, observe, will absorb 0.4 keV, that's 400 eV x-rays more strongly? And I know you can kind of squint at this, but just to make it a little bit easier, here are the cross-sections for absorbing photons. Photon energy is here, cross-sections here for oxygen and carbon. Okay, so which atoms absorb 400 EV x-rays more strongly, carbon or oxygen? Raise your cards high. Aha, and there is not unanimity. Well, here's the answer. At 400 EV, which is a vertical line I've drawn here, here's where it crosses the curve showing the absorption data, and you can see that carbon absorbs a lot more strongly than oxygen, okay? Now, here's the bonus round. Which atoms absorb 0.8 keV x-rays more strongly? Oh, well, okay, I gotta just show you this part, okay? Okay. Polls are about to close. Yeah, okay. Uh, answer is shown here. Oxygen absorbs more strongly than carbon at 800 keV. Now it's clear what happened in between this step function. Okay. The step function is simply due to the fact that a photon can only deliver as much energy to an electron as the photon has. And so if the photon's energy is not enough to overcome the work that it takes to liberate an electron, it won't do it. So here we're above the 1s shell for both carbon and oxygen, and oxygen is closer to the edge and therefore absorbs more strongly. And this is the kind of stuff that we're going to think about for the next half hour or so, why that happens. Okay. So let's go back and look at Schrodinger's equation for many electron, I said molecules. I'll dispense with the molecules soon. I really am not, but it is molecules at the beginning. Okay, so we have a function called the wave function that is a function of all of the degrees of freedom in the molecule. So here are all the positions of every atom nucleus, and here are the positions of every single electron in the molecule. It's a big mess, but it, is, it has something going for it, and that is it is a complete dynamical description of all of the motion going on in that molecule. Okay, in order to find what this quantity is, all we have to do is solve Schrodinger's equation, and it seems simple enough. But, wait, let's look at the Hamiltonian. First of all, I can separate it into a part that the molecule has all to itself, and then a part that's caused by an external field that I'm going to use to probe it, like the x-rays, and then the interaction between the x-rays and the molecule. So I've got those three parts. If I just look at the molecular part, which is the thing that is the corresponding thing to Schrodinger's equation that I showed in the very first slide, but now for the whole molecule, it just has all these moving parts. First, there's the motion of every nucleus. It, it gives it some kinetic energy, and that contributes to its total energy, and so it's part of the Hamiltonian. But the nuclei repel each other, and that also contributes. And then there are the electrons. And the electrons have their own kinetic energy. And they have their attraction to the nuclei. That's why the minus sign is there. And they have their repulsion from each other. So it has all those terms. All right, yes or no? Is it already too complicated? Finally getting unanimous votes. Um, let's clean it up. 
of course, I'm not an inventor of any of this cleaned up. M many of these things happened in the early 20th century. Some of them are newer than that. Um, but we'll start with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, two great, great science physicists of the early 20th century um, who figured out that there was a separation of time scales because nuclei are just a lot more heavy. And therefore, we could treat the nuclei at first as classical particles that simply have a delta function position somewhere and calculate Schrodinger's equation for the electrons with the nuclei held fixed. And that means that these capital R's are just parameters now in this wave function. They're not actually dynamical variables, and then you just solve that. Okay, I love the Born-Oppenheimer approximation because it reduces everything to a simple, something that's much closer to an atomic problem. The next is the Hartree-Fock approximation. Now, this one is the one that I, I'll just bet. How many people already feel that at the level I just described that you already knew about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? And, you know, almost everybody either raises their hand or they're even too bored to do that. Okay. Um, Hartree-Fock approximation comes next. We're getting a little bit more into it here. The Hartree-Fock approximation says something that you might think of as obvious, but actually it is terribly non-obvious. And that is the wave function can be expressed as a product of single electron orbitals. Well, haven't, isn't that what we've been doing all along? We've been treating these electrons as separate entities that can push away from each other and have their own positions. And, you know, so of course, of course, I should be able to represent this wave function as just a product of single electron wave functions. Okay, there is a little bit of a Pauli exclusion problem, but it's easily dealt with. I just take this wave function, which is now a product state, and I add to it every, every permutation of symbol uh, of orbital with position. Uh, appropriately anti-symmetrized. That's called a Slater determinant. Okay, that's just really easy. In fact, at that level of ease of calculating, there are standard programs to do this. In fact, there are even web-based programs to do this. And this is something that most people don't worry about. Although I've had a, had a really good time preparing this lecture, trying out some of these, and discovering that they don't all give the same answer. So, you know, easy though it is, different kinds of, different kinds of program writers uh, will allow for different levels of approximation to and, and errors to sneak in. But there's a reference list on that. Okay, just to bring it to sort of the picture form, here it is for sodium. I like sodium because I'm an atomic physicist, and so it's a hydrogen-like thing where mostly it's one electron outside a very compact closed shell. It has these single electron orbital types. 1s, 2s, 2p, and 3s. These first three are completely filled with electrons. Pauli exclusion doesn't allow any more electrons to go in. In other words, they have the 2n squared electrons in every one, but there's one electron left over, and it goes into 3s. You can use one of these Hartree-Fock programs for assuming that configuration that I just described, 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s, and you get the solid curves for the radial wave functions for each of those orbitals, or just for fun, take one of the p electrons and move it up into the s shell. It still has only one open shell, so simple programs can calculate that with the same lousy level of approximation, and you get these these small changes. So now you kind of get a feeling. Now we could talk for we could talk endlessly about this picture. I'm going to go on and not do that, but just just point out that 1s is close to the nucleus, that 3s is where all the action is happening for chemistry. Okay, let's go on. We got this far. Time to turn on the light, turn on the x-rays. So x-rays interacting with matter. I mean, there was a talk on it this morning. It's going to be a you know, very, very important part of everything that you think about doing in your own work with free electron lasers. What are the different, you know, let's break it down to the atomic level. What are the different things that can happen? Well. Uh, photoionization. We'll talk a lot about that. Um, either the core or the valence shell can photoionize. There's, there's shake up or shake off where photoionization is helped along or hindered by the emission of another electron due to a collision. There's Auger relaxation. This is a really cool one. There's no light in this picture. This is what happens after you've made a core vacancy. This evaporative cooling 
plus quantum mechanics. It's quantum evaporative cooling. So it's due to collisions, just like evaporation is. And it cools off the atom, just like evaporation does. So it's evaporative cooling, called OJ. Creates an electron that you can look at. There's photoabsorption, and there's fluorescence. There's all of these different things. And in every one, you can just see all these. These, are little, these little dots represent positions of electrons, maybe, or symbolically. And you just imagine them moving around, changing their energy. You know, very complicated. Okay. It's it's actually this is a place where the the the, the trees in the forest are getting a little too thick, and they obscure what's important. So we make the following approximation: the mean field approximation. It's uh, closely related, as you'll soon see, to Hartree-Fock anyway. So it's not a big stretch. And the mean field approximation says what's really happening is what's shown in these pictures. All of those background electrons, they're just part of the mean field. They're just the background. They are kind of like, like the vacuum is. They're just there. You're not going to do anything with them. And instead, only deal with the electrons that uh, interact with the light. So that's the uh, mean field approximation qualitatively. Uh, the way we can easily approach the mean field approximation, or I should say what the mean field approximation motivates, or to look at it the way it actually happened in the minds of the physicists who developed it probably, the, the, uh, the obvious way you wanted to treat x-ray atom interactions anyway, but needed the mean field approximation to get around to it, is second quantization for the, uh, the electrons that are, are moving around in the atom. So what is second quantization? Well, some of you already know. And how many people already know what second quantization is? Yeah, about that many. Are these the same people who didn't raise their hand when on the first day you were asked if you were not a physicist? I'm just curious. Not really the same people. OK, that's good. All right, so uh, what, is, what is that? that? That says that electron and hole excitations are created when the atoms uh, in, inside the atoms mean field using creation and annihilation operators, and that becomes the job of the Hamiltonian operator. So the Hamiltonian operator will contain these operators inside it called creation and annihilation operators that create either an electron or create an electron vacancy, sometimes called creating a hole, sometimes called, well, creating a hole is a good way to call it. So you can either create a hole, or you can think of that as a vacancy. And, and, and they have a specific um, uh, electron, specific position, and a specific uh, char, um, spin associated with them. And they obey the relations with respect to each other that they must obey in order for Pauli exclusion to still happen. And they have to have anti-commutation relations. OK. Now, here is your third question, or fourth question. Why do we introduce second quantization? It's simpler, or it's more natural, or it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah you've caught on. You've caught on. Uh, let's look at uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, X-ray and interaction uh, Hamiltonians in second quantization as well. Uh, that's the light. Now, a lot of us physicists actually already know this part. Maybe not all, but uh, creation and annihilation operators are, are commonly used for creating and annihilating photons. After all, they're easy to destroy. They're just bosons. You know, you can just eat them up by absorption or something. So creation and annihilation makes a lot of sense. And we, we do uh, look at quantum processes uh, involving light in terms of these creation and annihilation operators. And in that case, the energy in the field is just a bunch of these things put together. This is sometimes called the number operator. Occasionally, this is called, if, there's, if there's only a finite number of these things you're summing over, this would be called a Fox state, definite number of photons in the field. Let's not worry about that. Uh, just the fact that creation and annihilation operators run all the way down in these considerations. You can think of the atoms as just the background sitting there. We're going to either create an electron or create a hole or destroy a photon. And it's all about the creation and annihilation that we have to study. Okay. 
So let's uh, now uh, look at that uh, at, at, the, uh, at the processes that we want to study using the creation and annihilation uh, rubric. Well, uh, the interaction Hamiltonian now needs to have these things because uh, it's quite clear that I need to destroy a photon and uh, create an electron in photoionization, and I also have to create a vacancy. So here is all that stuff. It's all written out here. Here is the uh, annihilation. Well, here's the creation of a vacancy. Annihilation of an electron is the creation of a vacancy. Here's the creation of a vacancy. Here's the creation of an outgoing electron. And this A is loaded with its own photon annihilation and creation operators to create a photon. So it's all there. Uh, by the way, uh, for x-rays, this vector potential needs to include the dependence on momentum because k dot x is not necessarily small. This is a, sometimes people make a big deal about this in a lecture because they're trying to wean you from your natural tendency to be laser spectroscopist. But I figured this group is very sophisticated, so we don't have to do that. Um, Fermi's golden rule, which is the way we use perturbation theory to make a perturbation expansion in how dynamics happens, uh, then takes its ordinary form, except these Hamiltonian interaction operators are now these things. And you know, here's the one that you usually see when you uh, uh, find uh, a rate using Fermi's golden rule, but I'm going to include the second order just for the end of the lecture. Okay, so let's let's now go to work uh, using this stuff. Let's let's put second quantization to work on those single electron orbitals. So here was my description of the atom as the, just the product state of a lot of single electron orbitals, but now it's really just a vacuum state with a product of a lot of single electron creation operators. They're creating each one of those orbitals. So that's what that looks like now. Now these creation operators are creating electrons, and so they have these anti-commutation relations. You can see they uh, can either, either uh, not do anything, or they can uh, leave you with one and exactly one electron plus or minus in your final state. Okay, if I add up all of the single electron orbitals and their corresponding eigenvalues, their corresponding energies, that's the thing that we we saw we could calculate in Hartree-Fock, so hooray, we don't need to throw away our Hartree-Fock program. This is actually used for this, it's sort of designed for it. Well, the, the, uh, the, the operator that describes the mean field Hamiltonian is just the sum of all these eigenvalues times their corresponding um, uh, operators. Um, the, uh, the, the, the dis description of each one of these eigenenergies is just this Fock operator, it's called a Fock operator just like for photons, uh, operating on one of these orbitals, and the energy of the whole molecule, or the whole atom, is just that Fock state on that product state, so it's just the sum of all those energies. So this is becomes the complicated problem, is now the complications are swept under the rug, Hartree-Fock did, did its work, it gave us a bunch of eigenvalues, and now we're going to use them. Okay, so uh, here's the energy uh, that it takes to create a vacancy. That's the, that's the problem that we looked at before. How much energy does it take to create a vacancy like in the 1s shell? Uh, and so what we need to do is be looking at the creation of one whole state. The energy of the one whole state is the, ener is the sum of all of the energies of the single electrons minus the energy of that one. Therefore, that's the ionization potential. This is, uh, you know, in X-ray photoemission spectroscopy, these very, very basic ideas are kind of a big deal. Because if you go look at photoemission spectra, you expect, based on these very simple arguments, to just see electron spikes in your photoemission spectrometer corresponding to the energies of every electron that was liberated by having work done on it by a photon. In other words, you expect to see a picture that looks just like this. This is actually one I grabbed from the web, and because it's it's, it's owned by a commercial organization that analyzes your data. I want to keep all of that there. You can go to their website and find out much more information. I don't know anything else about them other than that. And the fact that they have this very nice picture, which shows uh, the result of a photoemission experiment where you take a 
single energy beam of x-rays. This time, they're x-rays that come from an aluminum target. They're very narrow uh, in energy. And they shine on some metal, in this case, not a metal. In this case, is sodium chloride, a salt. They liberate electrons. You look at their energy. And you see stuff, energy, lots of energies. After all, this is solid state. This is not a solid state lecture, though. So, but you also see all these atomic features. Every single one that I already talked about in sodium is there. There's, there's the 2p. There it was. There it is. There's the 2s, sort of at the right energy, right? Here's 1s, sort of at the right energy. So, so this very, very simple idea is actually pretty powerful uh, when it comes to interpreting data. In fact, really critical. By the way, there's a few other things in this picture that we'll come back to, this sodium KLL. We'll talk about that in a minute. OK, so uh, how, how much? How, how come some of those lines are big, some are small? What's the size? How do I calculate the cross-section, in other words? Well, same way. Um, we uh, create a particle whole state for photo, uh, pho photo emission. Uh, so here's our final state, just uh, something that uh, created an outgoing electron and destroyed a, 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 an electron that was at home. Uh, that uh, state then is uh, created, that final state is created from the initial state by the interaction Hamiltonian. This is just Fermi's golden rule written out in lowest order. Um, the uh, energy of the excited electron, just to conserve energy, has to be the photon energy minus its binding energy, which was just that, that uh, shell uh, single orbital energy that we calculated. And then that gives you the cross-section for emitting that component of your system, that, that uh, shell. And uh, you can plot that or calculate that as a function of photon energy or measure it. And every atom then has these characteristic features, sharp edges where you cross the threshold for being able to emit uh, electrons from inner shells. And notice this is uh, something that uh, you don't see obviously in the calculation, but it's easy to see in the data that this is a log scale. When I cross over a threshold to go, say, from n equals 2 to n equals 1, where's the case here? Here's the case in beryllium. No, here. This is a better one, oxygen then there's an order of magnitude increase in the total cross-section. Almost everything comes from the most deeply bound shell. That's just, that's the dynamical effect of the X-ray interaction with more deeply bound electrons being stronger than with less deeply bound electrons. So long as there's enough energy in the photon to even create a free electron. A few uh, obvious uh, things to observe. The cross-section rises like z to the fifth if you fix the photon energy and change z. Carbon has much stronger absorption than hydrogen. And it falls like the photon frequency or the photon energy to the minus seven halves power when you're above threshold. And you see that's kind of a universal thing. All these slopes are about the same. And they're all straight lines in a log-log plot. So that's a geometric. It's a, it's a, a power law. OK, so let's recap. We're not quite halfway done. Um, what did we do? We made atomic physics easy. Atomic units, or an Oppenheimer approximation, that's treating the nuclei classically. hartree fock approximation, that's this product of one electron orbitals. Mean field approximation, that's only keep track of the electrons and holes that change their state. And finally, second quantization, Field operators replace electrons, holes, and photons. Every one of these things made our problem simpler and simpler and simpler. And now I need a reading from the group. Vote uh, on your, your choice for how things have gone so far. Oh, wow. This is almost unanimous. <laughs> Good. OK. Any, oh, I, I was going to stay on that slide for a second. I was going to keep track of the, of the uh, clock and wait until it was uh, 10 minutes past 2 before I continue. So that means that I get a chance to ask if there's any little nagging doubt that you have in your mind that you should have been even taking going to the summer school. You know, is the, is the food been OK? Um, <laughs> 
you could also ask about the lecture. That would be all right, too. I heard about eating more beer. Yes? <laughs> OK, so far. Oh, oh, I see. Thank you. OK, okay I'm going to go on. OK, what does going on mean? Well, my own uh, field is interactions not just with x-rays, but with x-ray free electron lasers. And they're different. They're different from just regular x-rays. And to show how they're different, I have a back of the um, PowerPoint slide uh, calculation. So uh, let's just consider what LCLS delivers in a single pulse. So I went and looked. I don't know whether they are just, you know, overly optimistic or but at any rate I, I went and looked these are the these are the spec values okay. they claim that one pulse can produce actually I, I was a bit conservative here about uh, 10 to the 13 photons in this range of around a kilovolt and um, also that I can focus them to about a three by three micron spot something like that would like to be able to focus them more but this is actually not so bad because if I multiply those two numbers together, I get 10 to the 20 photons per square centimeter. And we already saw that at around a kilovolt, all of those photo absorption cross sections were on the order of a megabarn, 10 to the minus 18 square centimeters. So that means that on every pulse, every atom gets ionized 100 times. So how many of you believe that? Right. So I don't believe it either. I don't think that the atoms get ionized 100 times. I think that they get ionized, though, with nearly 100% probability. There's not much chance that they won't get ionized. In fact, it'll happen really fast. The, uh, the, the typical uh, time it takes per absorption here is a, about, a, about a femtosecond, one absorption per femtosecond. So this is, is pretty rapid, pretty rapid stuff. Okay. In fact, this is rapidly enough to ionize that it's fast enough to compete with the process by which these, uh, these, these uh, vacancies get filled, which is Auger relaxation. So I should say a little bit about OJ relaxation in the context of Robin Santra's wonderful method for thinking about electron-electron uh, collision. Not just his method, but I do like his notes. So plugging you to look them up in their full glory. So let's just take a look at OJ decay uh, following K-shell uh, formation. Here's the little icon that I had for it. Um, so what happens? Well, uh, three electrons are involved. It's a three-body process. Um, two of them uh, leave their previous state and, um, and, and uh, uh, one goes down to fill the vacancy, which was the third electron that left in photo emission. Uh, so you have the annihilation of an electron here, create a vacancy, and the filling of a vacancy here. So you, you see that. Here's filling the vacancy, and here's annihilating, and then you annihilate a different electron from uh, the upper shell to create an outgoing electron. So that's sort of what this means. You start with your ground state, you apply three different kinds of creation and destruction operators. Okay? And here's the initial state is just the one that you photoionize. The initial state it just has a, has a hole. Okay, well, we plug that into Fermi's golden rule using the uh, information we have about the Hamiltonian. And now the Hamiltonian that matters is the one where the electrons collide with each other. The light isn't present in this process. But the other part of the Hamiltonian is, including the electron-electron collision. And the, the result then is a, an Auger rate that depends on these matrix elements that involve the collision, the collision of two electrons with each other. So that means that uh, that destroys and creates two different electrons. That's the Coulomb 
repulsion matrix element because classically this is simply the Coulomb repulsion of electrons with each other that's, that's, that's at, at work here. So uh, a few uh, comments about uh, how this goes. Um, first of all, the, the energy for a particular kind, so KLL, what's the nomenclature? Uh, KLL means I filled a K vacancy and it cost me two L electrons. Okay, so now I have two L vacancies left over afterwards. That, that scales like Z squared, but its rate scales like nothing. That is, its rate's pretty flat. Doesn't really matter what Z is. Okay, well, those OJ energies also show up in these uh, X ray uh, photoemission plots, and uh, that was this uh, sodium KLL plot. And you can kind of see what energy it ought to have. Now, I should say that calculating those three body matrix elements, well, that's a challenge. I don't, I don't actually do it myself. Um, there are, are, are people in the atomic theory community who realize how important this is, and they do it a lot. Uh, but we don't need to worry too much about the details of the calculation to get the energies right. So this sodium KLL line occurs in this spectrum. Now, it's a usurper. It's an interloper. It, it's an X-ray photoemission spectrum, and yet it's got this line in it that didn't have anything to do with the energy of the photon. It's, a, it's just, you know, once you've made the vacancy, there's no light that matters anymore. It just comes out at its own energy. And what energy is that? Well, it's the energy left over from the energy you gain in having a, 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 an L equals 2 uh, electron fall down to the L equals 1 shell. So that's this kind of energy difference and then have another one of these L equals 2 electrons pop out. So then it, it costs this much binding energy to come out. So it's about this minus this minus this again. So you figure that it's 9850, something like that. Okay, 850. Why does it show up in this funny place on this binding energy? Anybody else? <laughs> um, well, I'm not saying there's no electron correlation, but that's no, that's not the answer I was seeking. This is sort of a family feud kind of a question, isn't it? We surveyed 75 graduate students and asked them the following question. I should have done multiple choice. I was, I was, I was, I was mistaken. It shows why you should always have the lecture at the ultra fast X ray summer school be the second time you give a lecture instead of the first. So it's sort of a multiple choice. Well, the reason is that this binding energy is the difference between the energy of the photon that went in and the uh, energy of the uh, electrons that came out. Okay. Or it, 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 it's, it's not the energy of the electrons that came out itself. The energy of the electrons that came out itself, you read from left to right, not from right to left. I don't want to know how much energy was left over in binding. I want to know what the kinetic energy of the OJ electron was. So that's zero over here at the source energy of the uh, photon beam that did the photoemitting, which is 1487 EV. And then you read to the right, and then you get about the right answer. You get that OJ electron. Another, another way to say that is that OJ electron that's got a mind of its own. It's going to have that energy no matter what. So if I changed the energy of the incoming photon, so long as it was possible to make a K vacancy, of course, the OJ energy wouldn't change. And in fact, this is a very important experiment. I have a lesson. If you're confused about your spectra, change the energy of the source, because that will sort out immediately the OJ lines from this photon. Everybody knows that, except the ones who don't know it yet. So that's why I said it. OK. So let's just proceed. Let's look at a process that uh, has uh, an LCLS beam um, creating lots and lots of photoemission. Okay, so here's, in my mind's eye, a slideshow, a stop-action movie of what's going on. 
photoionization happens very early within on the order of a femtosecond of the x-rays coming in because they're focused so tightly. Uh, and once photoionization happens, Auger relaxation takes over very quickly. The Auger relaxation doesn't really depend very strongly on what kind of an atom I use. It's always on the order of a few femtoseconds. And uh, then photoionization happens again, then more Auger relaxation. This is the process of ionizing out of the core and relaxing the atom from the inside out. And you, you can see how it's kind of an approximate way of looking at things. First of all, we did note that although core ionization dominates once you're above the edge, it only dominates by a factor of 10. So 90% of the 10 percent of the electrons are coming from somewhere else. So the valence shell does do some of its own ionization, and it better because in the end, the last little valence shell that valence electron that can't OJ because there's no, no other partner has to valence ionize. Okay. Why do I make a big deal about this? Because it's kind of cool. Also, it's the first experiment at LCS. This was experiment number one, zero, zero, 001. Uh, Linda Young led this experiment, and it was a very simple one. She looked at neon photoabsorption. Well, you're used to these pictures now. There's the K shell at uh, just a little under kilovolt. That's where the edge is. Right? And um, we, uh, Linda and her teams, change the energy of LCLS uh, over a range. They started below that edge, and they went above that edge. And why? Because they really wanted to know whether this PA, 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 as they referred to it in their highly cited paper, they wanted to know whether that actually did happen. You know, before you look, you wouldn't necessarily know. And, and, uh, and so at 800 EV, where you're below this edge, um, you can, uh, ionized pretty easily, but only it stops at around six times ionized. You go up to 1.05, that looks like it's above this edge. And that means that I'll have no problem liberating K-shell electrons now. Okay? And they ionized the heck out of it and got up to neon 8 plus. Now, those of you who are not atomic physicists will maybe have already forgotten that neon has 10 electrons. Once you've taken away 8, you have two left over. Why didn't they get the other ones out? I mean, they're above this edge. Another chance for multiple choice question. What, what happened? Well, well, let's think about it like this. If you just have a hydrogenic atom, a nucleus like neon, but only one electron, what's the binding energy? I, it's been on the screen three, four times already. Uh, I, I'll give you a hint. Z equals 10, and it goes like Z squared. And, and 10 squared is 100. OK, 100 times a Rydberg, so 1360. So it takes at least 1360 electron volts to ionize that last electron. And they, they just couldn't do it if they didn't have 1360 electron volts at hand. But turning up to 2 kilovolts, no problem. Right? All the way up to completely stripped neon. They jumped up and down. They wrote their fabulous paper, although it was only published in Nature. Big deal. I'm the vice president of the American Physical Society, so you know, nature, come on. Not a physical review letters, forget it. Um, full ionization of neon was possible. So that, that gave some, some uh, validity to the, the presumption that um, the atomic physics and the machine were actually working the way we thought. We were making so many electrons to get into the strong field regime. In fact, in fact, it gave us the idea for experiment number two, 
which is how long does it take the whole process to happen? You know, the PA, 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 and then V process. How long does it take it to happen? You know, each step takes a femtosecond, then you wait for the OJ, and then another femtosecond, then you wait for the OJ, and then another femtosecond, then you wait for the OJ. How long does it take for the whole thing to happen? So we thought this was a more difficult experimental problem to investigate, and we could do it. And so we were wondering whether this process could happen. I ionize both electrons from the K shell, and now you're stuck until OJ happens. And then eventually you run out of photons. Eventually you can't ionize anymore because the light's turned off. It just took so long to, to uh, go through all those OJs that the light was, was uh, light pulse wasn't long enough. Let's, let's, let's give that a try as an idea. So we did the following experiment. This actually took two two different runs, but that's just kind of a detail. Um, keep the same number of photons in your, in your beam in the same focus at all times. So you focus the light with a quarter of a millijoule of energy in the light, focus to the same, okay, everything's the same. Same kind of light, focus to the same size, same cross-section, same rates. Change one thing, and that is the duration of the pulse. This is something that you can't do at a synchrotron. It's another reason why we're kind of excited. Uh, between uh, less than a picosecond, or less, than a, uh, le less than a picosecond, quarter of a picosecond, to only a few femtoseconds, okay? And then see how the spectrum changes. It happens it was nitrogen uh, this time instead of uh, neon, so Z equals seven. But there's a very interesting result. You can see if you blow up to the higher charge state that the shortest pulses are unable to reach as high a charge state as the longest pulses, which can completely strip the atoms. And the reason, of course, is because the light turned off too fast. So we're now getting additional information. This is actually getting the, into the level of information that is extremely important when you're thinking about uh, trying to image some material without damaging it. How long does it take for the damage to turn on and so forth? OK. And then finally. What about that, that part that I said where you, you clear out both electrons from the K-shell because the ionization was so fast? Wow, that ought to make some weird kind of an OJ, right? Because now you don't even have a 1S electron in their screening for the relaxation. So we looked for it, figuring that it ought to be a higher energy OJ electron by about 100 volts, and you see it. You actually see it. Here's the full OJ spectrum, these different peaks correspond to different combinations of the, of the L-shell electrons participating in the OJ. But this little blip out here shouldn't happen at all, except it will happen if there's a, a single atom that loses both its K electrons before it OJs, and you get a higher OJ. So we got to see that as well. Okay. So let's get back to this edge problem. So here's a blown up version of, a, uh, of, of, a, of an absorption edge. Um, this happens to be for potassium. Potassium has Z equals 19. You know, when you're a really a real atomic physicist, as you all are for the next, uh, you know, few minutes, um, whenever you see something like K, immediately what clicks into your head is, ah, z equals 19. 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s squared, 3p6, 4s. Yes, we have a single electron outside a closed shell of, uh, of what, by the way? This is, uh, how, what, what, has, what has one few, what has 18 electrons? Aside from, aside from potassium plus. Yeah, that's right. You're exactly right. OK, so <laughs> uh, it's, it's argon. So if you look at this edge very closely, you see that there's uh, qualitatively two different kinds of things going on. I mean, there's lots of things going on. I'll focus on two. Um, there's a little bit of structure here near where the edge turns on. And so this is a different kind of experiment where now I'm tuning my laser, and I'm looking very closely if it goes on this edge. I see it's got little peaks. And wiggles in it, so so-called pre-edge or main-edge features, 
Um, all of that um, has to do with excitation of structure in the system. In this case, it's in an atom. Um, when you are close to, but either just below or just above, the ionization limit for pulling an electron out. And uh, these will play a big role in the next few minutes. There's also stuff that happens fairly high above the edge. And this is really, really interesting stuff if you're a solid state physicist, which I'm not. It's basically, it's, it's, the, it's the electron diffraction from its environment. As it's trying to get out into the detector, it diffracts from its environment. And that diffraction, of course, gives you a diffraction pattern. And that's the diffraction pattern in energy. That's what the diffraction pattern is. There's also things happen in space as well. So fine, that's called XAFs. This is called NEXAFs. Sometimes it's called ZANES. NE stands for near edge. That's what you have to remember about that. OK. So I'll show you an experiment that made use of it. I'll show you two experiments that made use of it. Here's the long references, because so many people worked so hard on these experiments, they deserve to be noted in the notes that you'll pull off the web for this, for this, this talk. And they did a lot of work, and I just get to talk about it. Uh, they were working with a hopelessly complicated molecule, but in a rather simple way. The molecule is thymine. Uh, some people think it's important because it's a DNA base. I think it's important because it absorbs UV light like crazy, but has this interesting property that having absorbed this light well above the energy required to rearrange bonds, somehow bonds don't rearrange in this molecule, at least not very often. And, and so it's got a protection mechanism. It's called photoprotection. And this was an experiment by these uh, researchers led by Marcus Gurr and Thomas Wolfe to figure out what the protection mechanism is. OK, so how should we think about the protection mechanism? OK, well, when the molecule starts out in its ground state, it has a, has a bunch of paired electrons. In particular, it's got paired electrons in this kind of an orbital here called the pi orbital. This pi orbital has lots of uh, electron wave function screening the carbons from each other in this ring. That's what keeps the ring together. When it gets excited, it goes into so-called pi pi state. This is great nomenclature for us, because this, uh, uh, this just means I, I created a vacancy in the pi orbital and, a, and a, an electron in the pi star orbital. So it's our, our second quantization describes this very well. And the problem is this pi star orbital Looks very, very bad for keeping the molecule together. Large force here between these two carbons should open it up. But that doesn't happen. Why? Speculation is that this population gets siphoned off in various ways, and we want to look for that. OK. So how do we look for that? Well, go back here again. One interesting thing about this pi star guy. See this little extra electron cl cloud over the red ball? Well, if you're a chemist, which I'm not, you'd know that because it's red, it must be oxygen. So that means there's extra electrons around an oxygen in the pi star state. So wow, we could look at the Auger line, which is not supposed to move, no matter what laser light we put in. But it will move, of course, if you change the environment of the oxygen. And so now we can look for that. So that's the idea. The idea is to photoionize this molecule with a very short x-ray pulse from an x-ray laser after it's been photoexcited with a time delay and measure that Auger spectrum as a function of time delay. Simple enough. So here's that, Auger, that, 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 uh, that, that probe photon going in and doing that. And here is the Auger spectrum represented in a kind of a weird way. I'll explain. What we want to do is look for changes in the spectrum. And so what you do is you subtract the spectrum from itself at negative time delays, or, del or when you didn't photo excite it. And that's why all this stuff down here below 0 in the delay line just looks like there's nothing there. It's, it's the OJ line subtracted from itself. But after excitation, you see a decrease in some parts of the line and an increase in others. And in particular, you see this nice little feature here. It doesn't last very long. That's the change in the OJ spectrum because of that little extra bit of electron cloud sitting on top of the oxygen after photo excitation. 
and you see that it doesn't last very long, which is you know one of the interesting outcomes of this work. Now it doesn't last very long. What else can we learn about that? Well, something that we can learn by uh, tuning right around the edge is whether the not the OJ line, but whether the photoabsorption spectrum itself changes. Does the edge shift? Does it pick up new features? We figured that it probably should, right? Because we had a filled pi pi state, that was the ground state, and we took one of the electrons away, put it somewhere else. So there ought to be a vacancy there. So, and, and, and we should be able to look at how things move around. So that experiment's been done as well. And here's the new feature that gets picked up. And now the nice thing is this is a picture that indicates what the vacancy is, right? Before, with OJ, we were seeing how long does a cloud hang around the oxygen? Answer, not very long. Now we get to see how long before the vacancy we created gets filled. Answer, kind of a long time. Kind of a long time. So uh, that's the, uh, that, that gives uh, some credence to the idea that there are other states in here, like for example this n pi star state, uh, taking up the uh, population uh, or, or maybe just very hot versions of the ground state that don't, but you know, it's beginning to look like the population is a good, is a good match. So no, the chemists take over at this point. They use this to validate their ideas about damage and photoprotection and all that great stuff. Uh, we atomic physicists just marvel at how time domain atomic physics is giving us the ability to make these kinds of insights. Okay. Last thing to talk about is elastic scattering. We didn't say much about that elastic scattering term. I did point it out. That was this thing that, you know, just like OJ has no photons in it, just electrons. So the elastic scattering term appears to have no electrons in it, at least none moving around. I'm not creating a new electron oval pair, but it's got two photons in it, photon going in and going out. Same deal, use the uh, method of second quantization to describe the states here. But now, what we're after with our rate, the thing that comes out of Fermi's golden rule, is we'd like to know, we know uh, uh, all, all, everything that we can know about the outgoing uh, photon, the outgoing photon in this process. We want to know how the rate depends on the outgoing photon, or another way of saying it, which photons are likely to be, which photon directions are likely to be the ones that we're scattering into. Uh, that's, the, that's the game here. Um, I'm going to go through this a little faster for two reasons. First, because I'm supposed to leave a lot of time for questions, even though I got started a little bit late. Just a little. Just a little late. Uh, but uh, the other reason is that um, I, uh, I, 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 I wanted to um, show you um, some, uh, some very basic data about this, but there's a lot of devil in the details that I can't really go into. For example, let's say you do this scattering. What about all the x-rays that don't scatter? How do you get rid of them? What about the, uh, the time delay between the x-rays and the uh, exciting radiation for whatever it is you want to scatter from? Um, what about the fact that the molecules are, are, are lumped together by only a, an angstrom or so, and yet we're using light that only has wavelengths of about an angstrom. And so, you know, how much resolution do we even have? There are all kinds of issues like that. It's a whole course in itself. I don't want to cover any of that because I want to focus on the time domain aspects. Here's the question. If you photoexcite a molecule and you're doing x-ray scattering from it, can you tell or not? Can you see it or not? You know, chances are you ought to be able to see it. So that's the experiment that was done by Mike Glownia's group. And the answer is, again, in this differential way, this is showing the differential scattering pattern. Differential scattering pattern changes, and it keeps on changing for uh, a few picoseconds after the excitation. So let's take a look at why. Okay. Uh, Glownia did an experiment in iodine, diatomic molecule, and the reason was that he wanted to have a very clean experiment where there's only one kind of motion that he needed to be interested in, and that was the, the distance between the two iodine atoms. 
So it was really a, uh, an atomic physics style experiment in that sense. He created an excited wave packet in the iodine system. Iodine system is fairly complicated, but it's not too complicated if you just shine in green light. If you shine in green light, you predominantly make a wave packet on this excited state called the B state, and that's a vibrational coordinate, the distance between the iodines. And you, know, you can imagine in your mind's eye that an ensemble of iodines will start vibrating like that. So that's, that's what he wanted to look at. Okay? Now, how, how to look at it? Well, this is a scattering experiment. So we have to think in terms, in scattering experiment terms. There's no change in the energy of the photons. There's no extra electrons created. It's just the direction of scattering. That's all there is. So the experiment, in its you know, greatest generality, is as simple as this. A plane wave of photons comes in. Uh, a spherical wave of photons go out, but it might not be a purely spherical wave. It's modified by a factor called the scattering factor, or the scattering function, and that's where all the physics is. Okay? Uh, nomenclature. People don't talk about the incoming or the outgoing momenta since their magnitude is the same anyway. It's only the direction difference that matters, and so it, we talk in terms of the scattered momentum, the, the difference between those two vector momenta. And the matrix element can be expressed in those terms. And this is the Fermi's golden rule matrix element. Uh, that, uh, you know, this is, the, this is the amplitude for it. Uh, the, the, the system itself, the, the, the molecule, didn't change its state. The operator is just the photon operator, e to the IQ dot R. And so the, the scattering probability, which is the, the square of that scattering amplitude, is just the square of this quantity. Now, there are two parts of interest. First, there's this epsilon dot epsilon prime. These are the polarizations of the x-rays, the one that goes in, the one that goes out. It's, it's curious, but I didn't have to talk too much about polarization in this, in this talk, but it, it turns out to be important in a scattering problem because there's a suppression of scattering in a direction where the outgoing electron's polarization has a, uh, a uh, non-unity dot product. That's not really the right way to say it. Uh, the right way to say it is that if you're, if, if you're the outgoing electron and you look back at the polarization of this guy and you see it foreshortened, that reduces it of the x-ray, of the x-ray. Then you see it foreshort. If you see that polarization foreshortened, that reduces the probability. That's the Thomson scattering cross-section. This is all the part that is for the, uh, the molecule. Okay? Now, this is some quantity squared. But it turns out that's not where the insight comes from. The insight comes from expanding this out and rewriting it as the difference in the uh, exponential scattering factor for the incoming and the uh, for the incoming and the outgoing light. Okay. So this Q dotted into the difference between two positions in the molecule. So this makes some reasonable sense if you think about this as a diffraction pattern. Because diffraction modulations don't depend on only what's in the path, but the difference between the spacing of things in the path of your molecule. So this is just turning this into a diffraction pattern. Uh, and uh, there are approximations that simplify this further. One we know well, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, means that we only have to, to, to uh, uh, worry uh, separately about the motion of the nuclei here as just you know this... Uh, motion that's separate from the electrons. The electronic motion is assumed to always be in the same place. And then the independent atom approximation is a really great one. Because we know that most of the cross-section is for the electrons right around the nuclei, we can think of this as just two nuclei with a separation from each other. So the entire problem reduces to one that has only one important parameter, the distance between the iodines. So, Having said all that, what's the scattering data look like? Well, you saw what the raw data looked like. One of the things that I can do is integrate over every scattering angle, uh, every scattering uh, uh, offset angle, every Q. So this is integrating around the azimuth of the scattering plane and just moving out in Q. And you can see that as a function of the time delay between pump and probe, there's some modulation here. If you look at how this scattering momentum translates into a, the, the position of the two atoms, just using the diffraction idea, 
you can see very easily that there is some modulation. And this is, of course, just the oscillation of the excited state. See a little bit more if you look at the angular dependence. And that's because the photoabsorption had its own polarization dependence. That meant that uh, molecules tended to absorb if they were lined up with the polarization of the incoming excitation radiation. And you can see that uh, the uh, X-ray scattering uh, reflects that well. You can see that there's a, a nice pattern that, depends on, uh, that shows how the angular dependence changes as well. And that can also be inverted to show uh, a scattering pattern. That one has this nice feature of a line that seems to be going off to infinity. That's because if you look very closely at this region that was excited, there were actually two states, and one of them dissociates. And so you can see them both at the same time. Okay. I'm not going to spend any time talking about out of seconds unless someone asks me. Instead, I'm going to end by putting back up the slide about the references. So I know that you guys are now have one day into LCLS2 uh, experimental proposals. And um, the, uh, the, the features that um, LCLS2 are going to bring to uh, the atomic physics problem are really profound. Because in most of those experiments I was showing you, we work in the gas phase, not very many, uh, not very many scattering or absorbing particles around. And so the ability to have a thousand times more x-rays, but not only that, but parsed into just a higher repetition rate is going to, is going to help these experiments too. So I'd be happy to talk to people in the questions or later on this afternoon or tomorrow uh, about uh, how you can incorporate this idea into your, your project. So thanks very much. And, and, I, and I have more than 15 minutes left, so this was right. totally... I was going to thank you for staying ahead of time. Yeah, okay. So we have plenty of time for questions. Who here, let's see, who here is interested in uh, photo, in, in scattering as a thing that you're working on? Actually, it's quite a lot of people. Of course, there were, are a lot of talks on scattering, too. I mean, you gave a very nice talk on scattering. Um, so you know, scattering in this, uh, in this context of uh, gas phase ensemble has some different features to it uh, that you can try to take advantage of. One of the different features is, you know, you can say, well, gee, it's really too bad that you don't have an ordered material, and therefore there's no brag spots. But, you know, as Mariano described yesterday, uh, all the interesting stuff is in between them anyway. So, uh, so, so, here, so here's a case where, in fact, the, uh, the change in the patterns that one looks at in an ensemble tend to be very, very broad features. And, it's, and, and, it, and it helps a lot with going to short time problems or problems where you're interested in very, very short pulses to be able to, have, be able to relax that uh, issue with, the, with respect to scattering. So that's sort of an experimental idea that maybe can, can enter some of your thinking as you work on novel scattering problems. I don't know if anybody's mentioned this to you at all, but um, it turns out that if you propose something that you could have done with LCLS 1, it's not, you should try not to do that. I mean, you should try, try to come up with those kinds of problems that are just out of our reach now. At least that's what, that's what the rest of us are, are always trying to do. Yes. Well, OK. Um, so you had a talk on, uh, a wonderful talk, actually, on, on how free electron lasers work. And therefore, you know about the SASE process. And you know that the SASE process is, although it's uh, spontaneous, that the noise has an interesting spectrum to it because of the, of the uh, I can never remember the right words, but because of the, of the relax, the, the, uh, 
the decoherence length. What is it called? It's not called that. Pardon me? It's slippage, but it's, they've got a fi fancy word for it. Because of the electrons moving out of the way. <laughs> cooperation, thank you. Because of the cooperation length, uh, there's a characteristic uh, scale to the, uh, to the bursts of energy that are coherent. And it's on the order of less than a femtosecond second uh, for uh, hard x-rays. In fact, it's better and better in terms of shorter and shorter as you go to harder x-rays. So uh, that, which is just a number of wavelengths thing. So that's really cool for people who are interested in attoseconds. So there have been some attempts to make use of that. So there's a really active project here uh, called, called uh, XLEAP that is uh, trying to make sure that bunches will only have one or a few well-spaced attosecond bursts. But in addition to that, you can, you can make really good use of it if you can do a pump probe experiment with it. And that's been the big hang up, but they now have a way of doing that as well. So it's called um, fresh slice. That's what they call it, I believe. The idea is that if you have a short electron bunch and it's, and it's all made to give you an attosecond pulse because of what the actually people done or for some other reason, um, you can actually turn it into two pulses by only allowing part of it to be in the right place in the undulator to laze, to, to uh, undergo coherent addition uh, of, of the radiation that it emits, while the rest of it is kind of a spectator because it's just not in the right part of the undulator. And then, by moving the electron bunch around, you'll do two things. First of all, you'll allow the x-rays that you made to move to a different part of the bunch. And then you can also retune where the bunch is. So you can get a second uh, undamaged part of the electron bunch to laze on the second part of the undulator. So you can make two different, di two different uh, colors of x-rays with a variable delay. So, you know, and, th and, this, and this works at least in a demonstration sense. I mean, th you know, there have been some, some dem demonstration uh, trials of this. So if you combine this with the out second pulse generation, it looks like it isn't, it isn't too uh, far-fetched to propose making use of something like this and being able to look at uh, delays on the order of one or a few femtoseconds and two colors where, say, for example, here's, here's one of my poster children. For example, you have a molecule that has two different kinds of atoms in it, and you want to excite or ionize uh, right at the location of one of those atoms by taking advantage of the, of the resonance enhancement that we saw, the edge enhancement, because you have light that's just the right color for that. But then look using either OJ or some other kind of excitation, look at how the charge moves to a different part of the molecule. I mean, this is, this is a grand challenge experiment. I haven't even told you what the molecule is yet, but it, it almost doesn't matter. There are so many possible ways that one could make use of this to understand electron motion, electron relaxation, charge redistribution in molecules. And so the, here, here there's a, if you connect the dots as freely as you should in a poster, uh, you can, you can uh, maybe make use of that. Yes? Oh, the rotational dephasing of the molecules. Sure. I know what you're talking about. Whoops. I knew what you were talking about, but I went the wrong way. Um, oh. uh, yes, the, uh, there's a, I can say a little bit about that. I'm sorry for having gone a bit fast over it, in fact. Um, when you excite these molecules, you can even see it in this picture, um, I tried to uh, be faithful to the fact that the polarization of the excitation radiation, the visible radiation that creates the wave packet, um, tells you which molecules were excited. And therefore, you make an aligned molecular ensemble. Now, molecules, of course, are not, their, their free field Hamiltonian uh, doesn't uh, have anything to do with the direction they point. In fact, they are eigenstates of angular momentum, not eigenstates of direction. And that means that if you make an aligned ensemble, it doesn't mean you can't make an aligned ensemble, it just means it's not an eigenstate of the free molecule Hamiltonian. It's a, it's a coherent superposition of a bunch of rotations. 
and they will dephase because they have different energies, those different rotational states. And that's what you're seeing. So let's go to the, the data that showed it. Okay, this one. So this, see the time delay here goes out to three picoseconds. And this is just uh, a model that assumed a thermal ensemble at the temperature that we knew that it was that became out of equilibrium only by getting excited so that a non-equilibrium distribution, a coherent distribution of molecules were in the excited state. And then, since we're looking at only scattering from the excited state, we can see how that part dephases and rephases. Given the temperature that we had to begin with, there's not much of a revival. You get beautiful quantum revivals if you do this with cold molecules. But you can at least see the first dip and then having it come back. The reason it comes back is because of rephasing. So if you had, uh, uh, it depends on the temperature, of course, but let's say that we had an infinitely cold sample that only had only one J state in it. Okay. Uh, then, just like a, just like a pendulum clock, uh, it would rephase uh, every fundamental rotational period forever. Actually, at half the period, because it's a homonuclear diatomic, but you get the idea. If you put some temperature in, then that, that gives you some uh, uncertainty in the initial phases, and that will eventually reduce the amplitude of those, of those revivals. If you put in enough temperature and don't distribute to enough, don't have enough J states in your, in your initial superposition, it'll even be critically damped. But typically, you're in between those two limits, and so you see it go to a minimum and then come back, and if it were a little colder, you'd see it come back more, and then maybe you even see a second, a second rotational revival. Okay. And I should also point out that iodine is particularly bad in this regard because it rotates so slowly. Uh, we typically like to do these rotation experiments in something a lot lighter so that things like collisional dephasing and you know, things that we actually aren't interested in at all don't start to interfere. Of course, those will affect the, uh, the iodine. It's, this, is assume, this, this assumes this, this curve was simply made by assuming that we had a 100 degree uh, Celsius uh, sample uh, uh, in, in thermal equilibrium, but not in rotational equilibrium. The rotations were excited by photoabsorption to those rotational states that you make in that uh, linear, that, di that dipole excitation. And then we focused on those, just the excited states, and we looked at how the scattering pattern changes as a function of time uh, from, from those states, and, that's, and, and that, that's basically what you see. So the, uh, the oscillation amplitude harder to see here than it was here. The oscillation amplitudes here, okay, you, you, you see those, you can actually see it happen, you see those kind of smear out. And then maybe they kind of actually come back. You have to be quantitative about that. And you see that it does start to come back just a little. Yeah, this is the experiment. This is the experiment. This is a calculation that uh, didn't have the um, experimental resolution in it, so it looks sharper. But uh, in other respects, we tried to have the right stuff in it. So it shows how you're actually exciting uh, to uh, more than one vibrational state, and there's dispersion in that. I should be very, very clear about what's shown here. What's shown here is just the uh, the the uh, uh, the rotation, and and so what we're interested in. I guess I should be a little. I should maybe maybe the confusion is that I I have to parse this a little bit more carefully for you. Um, this isn't all of the scattering. It's just the scattering that fits into this pattern. We project 
the azimuthal scattering onto S2. Now, of course, the oscillation that you see in S0, which was back here, the oscillation that's integrating all the way around the azimuth, well, that changes only because of the, the excited state iodines going away for some reason. Uh, other than that, it just smears. Uh, S2, on the other hand, you get to see how the angle smears. So it's angular smearing specifically that you're picking out. And you see that the angle smears. Here, there's very little S2. That means that not much is going on with respect to the angular dependence of the scattering signal at a time delay of one picosecond. But it comes back a little bit. Okay. What is it that you were most excited about regarding the LCI? Would you like to see done there that cannot be done yet? Oh, well, there's a number of things in that category, but, um, and, you know, I, I, want, I want to give you a broad answer so it can incorporate more than one thing. But uh, generally speaking, uh, nonlinear uh, spectroscopic methods apply to gas phase problems or solution phases as well. And by nonlinear, I mean the sort of thing where uh, you, two X-ray photons are involved. Uh, uh, that can cover um, in, in intensity issues, it can, like two photon absorption, but also anything that's pump probe, where both the pump and the probe are X-rays. You know, it's linear in the X, in the two X-rays, but uh, you know the real problem has been up until now that. Um, the, the only things we've been able to do that were really nonlinear with respect to um, X-rays in that way were, were, were real hammers. We weren't able to do anything very subtle at all. And that's a signal-to-noise issue. It's because you can only do so much averaging. Your entire data set is only going to consist of on the order of, of, of millions and not hundreds of millions or billions of, of, of individual um, uh, data collection uh, shots. And, and so the, you know, all of that can be improved enormously. And so the, 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 the sort of poster child thing that I showed, where uh, you know, that was like pulling out all the stops and saying we're going to have strong field and data seconds. So we're going to do electronic Raman redistribution, which is a two x-ray process for each one of the two x-rays, and then do the time delay. Well, you know, we'll probably have to work up to that. But surely, one of the early things that we'll be doing, and, uh, if, and other people will too, and probably will beat us to it, is uh, photoionize in one place in a molecule and watch the charge move to the other side. Uh, and and that, that you can just do with photoionization with a, a simple two x-ray experiment. And for sure, you know, we have, we have proposals nominally, you know, virtually in sense, we have a pr proposals in the hopper on that stuff already. So when we're writing proposals to get funding for our groups, we're certainly referring to those kinds of experiments. Now, I should point out that LCLS2A, small a, will have only, will not have the high rep rate for the hard x-rays, but LCLS2HE will. So some of the things that you'd like to do with imaging, where you require 10 to 20 keV photons to scatter, uh, you can still do them, of course, but you can't do them with the uh, enhancement of 100 kilohertz to a megahertz. Of, of repetition rate. So uh, that'll be coming later.